a talk in the middle of the fall. It's always fair to say that our plates are full when this time of year rolls around. We're through the first few weeks of acclimating to new classes and new beginnings in and out of the classroom, well past initial and second rounds of more major assessments in our classes, and team and club experiences of all kinds have taken hold and developed some rhythm. We are closing in on the end of the first marking period with grades due from teachers on Saturday of this week, followed by commenting on how all of you are doing in anticipation of sharing that thinking with your parents over Parents Weekend, scheduled to get underway just one week from tonight. This fall, we've been treated to about as impressive a slate of talks given by members of the faculty as any I can remember. Between Mr. Hesse, Dr. Mavity Madalena, Mrs. Waters, Mrs. Keller, Mrs. H, and Ms. Chanel, we've heard about integrity and responsibility and community and family and justice and technology and the incredible power of song. In addition to what each of these colleagues of mine shared, they also succeeded in pulling us beyond our lives together within this community and into lives and experiences they have lived and had well beyond the confines of the 251 acres we occupy here in North Andover. In so doing, they moved me in the direction of what I would like to spend a few minutes on this morning. First, I want to point to three relatively recent moments in history that inspired me at the time and continue to inspire me now. In an environment so full of discord and distress and pain and a level of political discourse that feels like it is at an all-time low, I have found myself reaching for moments when this country's aspirations, its character, and achievements have felt good to me. This keeps me going. Second, and perhaps more importantly, I will close with the second Chipotle challenge test, well aware of the fact that by doing so, I am committing myself to an annual event. The truth is that seeing so many of you experiencing the wonder of Brooks School's outdoors last October was so much fun, and I'd like to give that another try with a new wrinkle this year. It's just too good to pass up. I remember clearly standing in this chapel on the morning after the presidential election eight years ago during my first year as head of school and sharing some thoughts with all assembled about the historic election the previous night. Barack Obama was on his way to becoming this country's first African-American president a notion that I would have considered impossible if you had asked me about the odds of this country electing an African-American president at an earlier stage in my life. In March of that year, at an early juncture of the campaign, and well before President Obama had even earned the nomination to be the Democratic Party's candidate for president, he was under heavy criticism for a relationship he had with a man named Jeremiah Wright, Reverend Wright had been President Obama's pastor and spiritual advisor and had made some remarks in a sermon that a number of people in the country had found offensive. The comments were centered on race and many wanted to know if President Obama shared Reverend Wright's views. He responded then with a speech on race that he titled, A More Perfect Union. I was moved by the speech at the time and inspired by the President's resolve in facing what I thought was an incredibly unfair challenge. He closed the speech with a story about his campaign, and I quote, There is a young 23-year-old white woman named Ashley Bea who organized for our campaign in Florence, South Carolina. She'd been working to organize a mostly African-American community since the beginning of this campaign, 
And one day, she was at a round table discussion where everyone went around telling their story and why they were there. And Ashley said that when she was nine years old, her mother got cancer. And because she had to miss days of work, she was let go and lost her health care. They had to file for bankruptcy. And that's when Ashley decided that she had to do something to help her mom. She knew that food was one of the most expensive costs, and so Ashley convinced her mother that what she really liked and really wanted to eat more than anything else was mustard and relish sandwiches, because that was the cheapest way to eat. She did this for a year until her mom got better, and she told everyone at the round table that the reason she joined our campaign was so that she could help the millions of other children who want and need to help their parents too. Anyway, Ashley finishes her story and then goes around the room and asks everyone why they're supporting the campaign. They all have different stories and reasons. Many bring up a specific issue. And finally, they come to this elderly black man who's been sitting there quietly the entire time. And Ashley asks him why he's there. And he does not bring up a specific issue. He does not say health care or the economy. He does not say education or war. He does not say that he was there because of Barack Obama. He simply says to the room, I am here because of Ashley. I'm here because of Ashley. By itself, that single moment of recognition between that young white girl and that old black man is not enough. It is not enough to give health care to the sick or jobs to the jobless, or education to our children. But it is where we start. It is where our union grows stronger. And as so many generations have come to realize over the course of the 221 years since a band of patriots signed that document in Philadelphia, that is where the perfection begins." End quote. In the midst of challenges we continue to face centered on race. The aspiration the president shared that day via a story about two people and what connected them continues to inspire me. On that same day in chapel when I shared some thoughts about President Obama's historic election, I also remember sharing some thoughts about the graciousness with which John McCain conceded that election the night before. What follows is some of what Senator McCain shared with his supporters, and I quote, my friends, we have come to the end of a long journey. The American people have spoken and they have spoken clearly. A little while ago, I had the honor of calling Senator Barack Obama to congratulate him on being elected the next president of the country that we both love. In a contest as long and difficult as this campaign has been, his success alone commands my respect for his ability and perseverance. But that he managed to do so by inspiring the hopes of so many millions of Americans who had once wrongly believed that they had little at stake or little influence in the election of an American president is something I deeply admire and commend him for achieving. This is an historic election, and I recognize the special significance it has for African Americans and for the special pride that must be theirs tonight. Senator Obama and I have had and argued our differences, and he has prevailed. No doubt, many of those differences remain. These are difficult times for our country, and I pledge to him tonight to do all in my power to help him lead us through the many challenges we face." End quote. When I heard Senator McCain deliver this speech live, it was his character that struck me most. His selflessness in the midst of what must have been the most devastating political moment of his career astounded me. 
I wonder if we will see anything resembling the grace and dignity with which Senator McCain left that election when one of this year's candidates concedes in a few weeks. From the time I was about five years old through my high school years, my family spent the summers on Cape Cod. I had a summer job through two of those years in a glass shop where my brother and I both worked with what was predominantly an older group of men. All of them were incredibly kind and good to the two of us, and somehow we knew that most of these men were gay. But they were not out about their sexual orientation. We never talked about it. I thought of all of them on the day last June when the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage and opened a door to a fundamental part of life that they and everyone deserves. I was particularly moved by the closing passage from Justice Anthony Kennedy, who wrote the court's opinion, and I quote, no union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. As some of the petitioners in this case demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death, it would misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right." End quote. In moments when I despair over government's inability to achieve outcomes and realize change that is so impactful on how people are permitted to live their lives, I turn to Justice Kennedy and think about what one Supreme Court opinion has done to improve the lives of millions of people. I think of the difference words can make, and it gives me hope. Thus, when I think leaders aspiring to reach for ideals are in short supply, I think of President Obama and the story about those two campaign volunteers. When I lament an absence of character, I turn to Senator McCain and recall the manner in which he conceded the presidency in 2008. When I seek evidence of the difference government has made in the lives of people, I read the final paragraph of Justice Kennedy's opinion, making gay marriage the law of the land. Beyond staying engaged in the discord and distress and pain that many are experiencing and feeling within a political climate that is so polarized, I find solace and hope by looking back and knowing that aspiration and character and achievement of the sort that moves me will visit again. Good people will carry the day. And now for the Chipotle challenge. I was on my way to this talk before Mr. St. Cyr's incredible talk on Monday about all the trees on our campus and by extension the natural beauty of this place it might sound sort of corny to you, but I also find solace and hope simply by taking a long walk at Brooks School. So instead of directing all of you who would like to take on the Chipotle Challenge to places that I love on our campus, I'm going to capitalize on Mr. St. Cyr's primer and ask you to share with me your five favorite trees on our campus. To meet the challenge, you will need to do the following. And I'll send this by email after chapel. Number one, you must work in a group of at least five or more students and a faculty member counts. It can be combinations. Number two, 
at least two of the five trees must be along the lake and fire trail stretching from the boathouse to the northwest corner of the campus. Number three, you need to take a picture of your group at each of the five trees you choose and send those pictures to me by email with a brief explanation as to why you like that particular tree. And number four, you need to complete the task by the end of next week, the Saturday of Parents Weekend. Details will be forthcoming. Good luck and thank you.